right? Uh, because it's, it's through the uh, act of communicating that we learn, and if we never communicate properly, then we never know who exactly we're dealing with and what their trauma is. Well, that is done in the intervention and accountability work groups for these men. It's done with a male-female team. And how critical that has become is because the men in an all-male environment tended to not be confronted about the norm of a man or the way a, a conversation would end with, you know what I mean, man. So that disallows an interruption of that type of thinking. So when there is a male-female team in that intervention and accountability setting, the person is being challenged by how a female voice is or isn't being heard. And especially if the male or female voice is maybe a representation of a partner, a mother, a daughter, a sibling, uh, somebody who is not male in the family who might have been trying to get information across that barrier wall of a threshold for violence. Like, when you yelled at me, I got nervous. Well, maybe a guy won't say I got nervous to another guy who has been yelled at. Because there's something else going on, a dynamic different than what would happen when a female. So the threshold about when is something becoming violent, I think we have grown a little bit lax in our communities and in our relationships. We've allowed certain things because it hasn't, he didn't crack my jaw, but he did embarrass me in front of my friends. So my social contacts have been depleted and maybe stripped and I'm so ashamed, but I can't say that. I can't openly confess that you hurt my feelings when you said that in front of my coworkers or my mom. Or those, those are thresholds about how the mounting of abuse has been occurring and being continued. So we have to think about what are we allowing? How do we keep a person safe when we don't internally think Think it through. Did I feel something, a twinge, when that person said that or did that or suggested that? Maybe I needed to say something or do something or just interrupt that stream in some way, especially when it's men and men's company. Thank you. Yes. Oh, yeah, I was going to come to you next. Go right ahead. I just wanted to elaborate. One of the things that um, I talk to women about, you almost have to interview the person that you're um, meeting who wants to talk to you. And men have to do the same thing as well because we know there are men and women perpetra perpetrators. So it's like an interview. It's not like you're going to just say, oh, this and that. But you want to find out more information. And you want to look at it not to get into the emotional piece but to stay in your head, just like you're on a regular job interview, you want to ask questions. Oh, you know, how's your mom, your sister? And then if they're talking about a young lady that they have children by, and they're calling her out of her name, you need to put yourself there, well, they're going to call me out of my name, too. It's an interview. You're interviewing them into your home, into your body. And when that happens, you become part of their trauma because we, we have triggers. Mm -hmm. And just going back to your story, wonderful story and the unique thing here, sister, she decided I am breaking this generational pattern. It's not gonna happen with my babies. And she did it. But one of the things that happens, I call it a dance. When we get into a relationship, you know, you start having certain feelings for a, a, a person, you know how that goes. When marriage or even wanting to be engaged is involved, that is saying something deep to us as women emotionally. He has to love me. And you know what? He has some bad habits, but we're gonna work through them. I'm gonna fix them because I'm going to be good I'm going to make sure everything is right. right. I'm going to do everything because the other person who was with them, she couldn't do that. Right. That's why he had to beat her. Wow. Right. So that's what happens in our dance. 
it's not easy to leave. It just isn't. It's so emotional. It's part of who we are. It becomes part of our body. It's sitting right in here. And it could be a reminder of past abuse. Because when we were whipped as children, we didn't say that that was abuse. We would go out there and get the switch for mama. <laughs> now check that out. These kids these days, well, they, won't, they won't do that. But we did. Oh, you want it and then we'll take it slow and try to find a big one. No, you give me a thin one. And when you grow up in it, even though honestly in their hearts, they were trying to discipline us in the best that they can, that they could during that time. But when you hear about abuse to where children are being tortured or th things are really happening, as adults now, if you experience any of that, we didn't identify it as abuse. So the next generation, our children, they go through it. And we don't know. And then when we get into relationships, it's not a big deal if someone slaps or punches and stumps me. Well, dad did it all the time. So I think what we have to do is really understand who we are in this moment and not be ashamed. And to forgive ourselves, that is a virtue just to forgive ourselves for what we have gone through and being part of it. It's the human condition. There's certain things we have, these needs that we have to have for ourselves. But we have to just stop and breathe for a moment and know that if there are women who are experienced domestic violence, they had brothers in the same family that are experiencing the aftermath, the impact of what has happened in that home. I have an example. I just uh, met with the young lady. And on in my calendar, they put down who's, who wants to meet with me at a certain time. And they had a child's name down. You know, a young, young child. And I'm like, well, mm, that's interesting. Well, anyway, she came to meet with me. And then so we start talking about different things and then we talk about what was going on. And it was about her son, it wasn't about her. She says, you know, he got kicked out of a daycare and he's three. And I said, kicked out? I said, yeah, he kicked, a, he kicked one of the instructors in the head and she has a concussion. And I said, this three-year-old who I could pick up with one hand? And she was just talking about, she says, now he's in another daycare and she's in fear of it because they're already talking about his behavior. I said, how much domestic violence did he witness? She said, a lot, from the time he was born. So his mind, the way he's thinking, he knows no better. Your first social, your first social environment is your home. That's your lifestyle. Whatever that little child learns in there, that's what he's taken out in his environment. And he took it to daycare. And she's trying to figure out, how do I, what do I do? So we had to start right in my office with him because he was in the office. And I says, this is, we're gonna have parenting right now. And she had to learn that she's bigger, she's stronger, and she's wiser than a three-year-old. Because she was like, boy, when he's in public, he just acts out. I said, no more. So we were working on that, but it's the truth. And you, we see it, we'll see it in our grandchildren, we see it in our nieces and nephews, and even in our sons. So if you have sons, if you have children that you're around and you see this, don't call them bad. These babies are traumatized by seeing trauma. So we have to put on our eyes, our ears, and really be in our spirit in this moment of mindfulness and look around us in our families and see what we see and help the next person so that we can eliminate domestic violence in the next generation. A lot of men that I know in some relationships I've even been in, um, I've actually been in domestic, uh, I could have been in a domestic abuse relationship because two of the men that I dated used to beat every woman they had. Somehow, I never got hit. And their daughter was like, I don't know how you're getting away because my dad used to beat the hell out of his girlfriend before you. And I'm like, I, I don't know either, but I probably would have tried to kill him. So I don't know. <laughs> but I do know that the men didn't respect their moms is what I started seeing the common thing. 
They have no respect for their mom. So doing an interview and learning, do you, what kind of, what kind of relationship do you and your mom have? Ask that question, start there. And if you don't get a good answer, enjoy the dinner or whatever you're doing <laughs> and move around. Because that's the beginning of the end. If they don't respect their mom, then the good chance they're not going to respect you. So there's a good, that's just a good place to start. You know, don't even get your emotions involved. You know, that's just walk away. So, because that, you know, because I mean, if you do that, then you just save yourself a lot of trouble. There's no point in trying to figure him out. You ain't going to fix him. He's going to break you. You're not going to fix him. And so, you know, I'm, I'm a big component of just, I don't want to spend time. Because I don't want to spend 20 years of my life to divorce or walk away from you. I want to walk away from you in the first hour and find my king because I'm looking for, I'm a queen and that's what you got to remember as women, you're the queen and you're looking for a king. So if you, if you put yourself in a position where you don't even have a man that, because a king loves his mother, she's the queen that he came from. So if you're looking for a man and he don't love her, just walk away and find your king. Save yourself some time. So let's come back to you now with that question about the kids. I do want people to know today, are there resources for children who have witnessed abuse or trauma? How can they get help? So I'm an abused, I'm, I'm abused, I don't know where to go. I didn't come to Terry Tubman, but I got a daughter, I got a son, and I don't want them to turn out that way. How do I get them help so they don't follow in my footsteps? Yeah, there is um, help for children. We have the Wilder Foundation. We have that Wilderson Associates. We have um, different other um, places that people can go for that. Um, we have Kente Circle. Um, we There's John Taborn. There's so many different places that um, people could go. I think it'll be wise if we have just like a resource list. And of course, Tupman, Women's Advocates, and um, and Oasis. Yeah. Because the work we do, especially with the moms that are caregiving for those secondary witnesses and secondary victim survivors, from infants to teens, Oasis Kids Place is available. And there's information on the table about that. But we really do support women making that quality decision to get the care for themselves as well as for their children. Sometimes they will tell you, my baby was not born, I was eight months pregnant when I got kicked down the stairs. Or they'll say, well, my baby was just two years old. But you have to remember that the developing brain is absorbing all of the traumatic impulses around it in vitro, inside the womb, right? Maybe can't see dad's face or whatever the person looks like, but can really um, assimilate that trauma into their very existence. It's on a cellular level. They, they don't see it maybe until the child is three in preschool. And believe me, there's a lot of different discussions around early assessment for ADHD and all those things like that. But when you take a real closer look, that trauma-informed look, you might be able to determine some of the ways the child is behaving is what has been kind of imprinted. Yeah, go ahead. I, I do want to say that if you have children that have been identified as ADHD, and you know that there's a lot of trauma, domestic violence in the family, alcohol, drugs, whatever, um, many times the child is traumatized, the child could have been hit, if they're very young, they could have been in their high chairs and they could have fall, fallen. So there's a lot that mothers don't tell a doctor. So they'll bring the child into the doctor and the doctors say, hey, have the baby, has he fallen? No, because they're afraid of child protection, things like that. But as you are aware of your own families as adult women, you want to keep your eyes open. And if you say, oh gosh, my daughter, here she goes again with this terrible person or whatnot, you probably want to kind of play a role if that's possible, especially to get the youngest as you can out of there and um, to find help for your, your daughter. 
um, I just want to just say to his brother, he made an excellent uh, a comment about moms. What happens many times, mothers take on their pain because of the father, they'll take it on to the son. And the son is treated inappropriately. And some of the men that are dating sisters have been treated that way. So going back to what Tracy was saying in the interview, what is your relationship like with your mom? And some guys will say, I hate her. Sure. And there's some pain, there's trauma, he needs help. Now, if you take them on, as Tracy said, oh, dinner was great. But if you take him on, you, you're taking on that pain, that trauma that he probably hasn't touched. Wow. And it could have happened to him in many years ago. So we just want to be very mindful of ourselves as human beings. What is the most important thing a victim should do or what is the worst thing that they could do when leaving out of a domestic abuse relationship? The worst thing is blame themselves. The best thing that they can do is and, and I always look in it from the mindset standpoint that one, if 10 times out of nine, it wasn't your fault, right? Because hurt people hurt people, right? So when someone finds themselves, and, and I think the sister alluded to, when she was like, well, what did I do? What can I do better? Well, you may not be the one that has the issue, right? You have a victim and a victimizer. The victimizer would never acknowledge the power that they get from victimizing. They would never relinquish that power, right? So in, in that is where, you know, the, the dysfunction lies. So the, so the worst thing that an individual can do is blame themselves, right? Um, and also shut in. Right, because we deal with, um, I'm, I'm a soul medic, so we deal with um, uh, psychological first aid, right? Try to get people unstuck, right? Um, and, and one of the, one of the basic, because, so when we talk about domestic violence, I kind of see it a different way because when we have homicides in the community, I understand that it's domestic violence, right? On another level, it's not basically in the home, but it's in the community. And this is what we see. And, and when we have, unfortunately, somebody whose life was taken sitting out in the street and, and the family members and everybody are standing around looking at it as a, as a family unit, as a community, that's domestic violence in itself. So the people who are witnesses to that, they, they are traumatized on top of the trauma. So it, it's, it's important for us to help us get unstuck when we find ourselves in, in the situations. Nobody's gonna help us, I ain't, you know, it got snow falling out the sky and rain, ain't nothing else falling out the sky. So it's only gonna be that, that us, that, that helps us get unstuck and, and sometimes it's just, you know, uh, can I get you some water? You know, I can't say it's gonna be all right, but I'm here with you, right? Because you know, telling somebody it's gonna be all right might be a lie, it might get worse. So we don't wanna to lie to our people, we don't wanna to lie to ourselves, right? So whatever happened, I don't know, but I'm here with you. And if I ain't gotta say nothing just to sit here with you, we can sit here for hours, right? That's the best thing, one of the best things that we can do um, in these situations is not shut down, but um, And, and, and I guess it's, it's on the reverse side. When we see somebody shut down, reach out to them. Because when you shut down, you can't reach out and shut down at the same time, right? So it's, it's, a, it's having enough care and concern for each other to know when we go through something that we need somebody. Even if we don't say, when we cool, we all right. Right. right? And most dudes, you know, we done went through something, we, ah, oh, no, we cool, I'm straight, right? Not knowing that what you went through would send you on a spiral, and, and it may not have even been your fault. And, you know, as a um, cursor, I, I've 
because of my um, social conduct, I did almost 13 years in the prison system. And in that setting, I realized that all the men that was there, a lot of them, something happened to them, right? To make them just think all the way off cue. Something happened to them and they never got any help. They never got, they never even told nobody, right? Until, you know, about 30 years and they sentenced and then somebody come up and they're like, oh yeah, that happened to me too. It's like, that's why you been acting like that? So, you know, having that care and concern for each other when we see, you know, people start, you know, falling back and getting into shells, you know what I'm saying, reach out and, 